So hello again, let's continue our discussion of the material properties of semiconductors. So what, we're, what we'll be talking about in this lecture are the three main types of semiconductors, crystalline, polycrystalline, and amorphous. So let's begin just by defining what we're talking about. In a semiconductor crystal, each atom occupies a very specific location in what we call a crystal lattice. In a polycrystalline semiconductor, there are many different crystals. It's just that there are small crystal grains that are oriented differently with respect to each other. In an amorphous semiconductor, the atoms are distributed more or less randomly throughout the material. Now, it's not, it tends not to be completely random. We saw in the previous lecture that each silicon atom is surrounded by four nearest neighbors. In amorphous silicon, each silicon atom is surrounded on average by about four nearest neighbors. So it's easiest to draw a crystal and to illustrate what we're talking about by doing it in two dimensions. So this would be a two-dimensional crystal lattice. There's a separation A in one direction, a separation B in another direction. So this is not completely artificial. There are two-dimensional electronic materials. The most notable one was graphene, which was discovered uh, in, uh, in about 2011 and which was the subject of a Nobel Prize. Graphene is a one atom thick planar sheet of carbon in a honeycomb lattice. And people are exploiting or looking at doing research to try to exploit many of the interesting electronic features of semiconductors like this. Graphene is just one example. But in this course, we're largely going to be discussing three-dimensional bulk semiconductor materials. And we'll only use these pictures to, to sort of illustrate some concepts that apply to both 2D materials and to 3D as well. So one important concept is something we call a unit cell. A unit cell is the smallest unit that can be used to reproduce the entire crystal simply by translating it around. Uh, this is one unit cell. You can see we could build up the entire crystal from that. This is another unit cell. We could replicate this cell and build up the entire crystal that way. This is another unit cell where one quarter of each atom is on the corner of that rectangle and we could produce the entire crystal lattice that way. So unit cells are not unique. Uh, if the unit cell consists of only one atom, then we call it a primitive unit cell. You can also see that a primitive unit cell is not unique. This is also a primitive unit cell. There are four of them in this rectangle, but we can only count one quarter of them in each of the rectangles because they're shared with other rectangles beside it. Now, we'll often talk about a lattice that specifies the location of each atom. Sometimes in a semiconductor material, there will also be a basis. At, at each point, there will be additional atoms that are associated with it. So we talk about a lattice plus a basis. So this whole structure of crystallography, you can take entire courses on it. People have uh, thought about this for a long time. It turns out that in three dimensions, if you ask yourself, how many ways are there that we can arrange a set of points such that if I sit at any point and look around, the environment will be identical to any other point. And it turns out there are only 14 different ways to do that. These are called the 14 Brave lattices. Now, three of them are very simple and easy to draw. Three of them are cubic lattices. There's a simple cube, which would have the atom at the corner of uh, each of the eight corners of the cube. There is something we call a face-centered cube, which in addition has an atom at each of the six faces. And there's something called a body-centered cubic crystal structure, where there's an atom in the middle of the cube. So different materials, some materials will crystallize in these simple features. These are three of the 14 possible lattices that materials can crystallize in. Now, this is the way we've been drawing the silicon lattice. It's, this is not a primitive cell. You can see that there's many more than one atom in this unit cell. But it's a cubic cell, so it's very convenient and easy to understand and draw. Uh, the spacing, the edge of the cube is 5.43 angstroms. This is known to a high degree of precision from X-ray crystallography. Um, if we look at any atom in this uh, silicon lattice, you can see, for, for example, this particular silicon atom has four nearest neighbors right here. 
And each atom, each one that I look at has four nearest neighbors. The bonds, you know, these represent the covalent bonds that are holding the crystal together. The angle between those bonds is about 109 degrees. This is one of the early successes of quantum mechanics, being able to predict these bonding structures and what those angles should be. Now, if you're good at visualizing things in three dimensions, you might be able to see that this is actually two interpenetrating face-centered cubic lattices that are offset by one quarter of the diagonal from the body of this cube. If you don't see that, don't worry. It won't be important for us. But we should try to understand this particular lattice because this is an important one that is uh, ref that uh, represents not only silicon, but other common semiconductors as well. So this is the lattice. Uh, silicon crystallizes not in the silicon lattice, but it's called the diamond lattice. So diamond also crystallizes in the diamond lattice. Germanium crystallizes in the diamond lattice. If we take a look at this lattice a little more carefully and we try to count the atoms, you can see that there are eight atoms on each of the corners of the cube. But we can't count those eight atoms totally in this cube because they're shared. If we stack all of these cubes together in a three-dimensional structure, each one of those eight atoms is shared with eight adjacent cubes. So we can only count one-eighth of them, each of them uh, for this particular cube. There are also atoms on each of the six faces you can see here. So there's an adjacent cube in a three-dimensional structure, so we have to share that atom on the face with an adjacent cube. So each of those six atoms on the uh, faces are shared with adjacent cubes. So if I count the number of atoms in this unit cell, there are eight on the corners, but I can only count one-eighth of them here because they're shared with eight neighbors. There are six on the faces, but I can only count half of them because they're shared with an adjacent uh, with an adjacent cube on each face. And if you look carefully at this structure, you can see that there are four inside. So we have eight times one eighth plus six times one half plus four. There are eight atoms in this important unit cell for semiconductors. So just with this knowledge, we can do some important calculations. The lattice constant of silicon is known to be 5.4307 angstroms. We have eight atoms per unit cell. I said earlier that the number of atoms per cubic centimeter in a, in a silicon lattice is about 5 times 10 to the 22nd. So we can see now how that's computed. We have eight atoms. The volume of this cell is the length A cubed. If we plug numbers in, the answer comes out as 4.99 times 10 to the 28th per cubic meter. Now, per cubic meter is a proper SI unit that we can do calculations in. Semiconductor people tend to prefer to do things per cubic centimeter, so you have to be careful. But we can convert per cubic meter to per cubic centimeter, and we would tend to quote the density of atoms per cubic centimeter in silicon as about 5 times 10 to the 22nd. Remember the intrinsic carrier concentration, the number of electrons and holes that uh, result from the breaking of these covalent bonds is about 1 times 10 to the 10th at room temperature in silicon, which is a really 12 orders of magnitude, more than 12 orders of magnitude, smaller than the density of atoms. If I want to know the actual density in grams per cubic centimeter, I can do that calculation as well. The density is the total mass in this unit cell divided by the volume of the unit cell. The atomic mass of silicon is 28. Remember, the atomic mass units are about the mass of a proton, about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms. If we take the total mass in the unit cell divided by the volume of the unit cell, we get the density in proper SI units, kilograms per meter squared. And then we convert that to grams per cubic centimeter, which is the way semiconductor people like to quote it. So about 2.3296 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. We can also ask other questions, like how close are silicon atoms in a silicon lattice? What is the nearest neighbor spacing? Well, to do that calculation, remember that the edge of the cube is the length A is about 5.4 angstroms. The diagonal of the cube is the square root of 3 times the edge of the cube. And if you look carefully at this lattice, you can see there's an atom in the corner, and there is an atom one quarter of the body diagonal 
away from it. That's its nearest neighbor. So the nearest neighbor spacing is the body diagonal square root of 3 times a divided by 4. That's 2.35 angstroms. So the lattice spacing is 5.4 angstroms, but the nearest neighbor spacing is 2.35 angstroms. So we can do these kinds of basic calculations, and I would encourage you to look at the homework assignment and to try to get some experience in doing them. All right, we've been talking about crystal lattices. What is a polycrystalline material? Well, a polycrystalline material is just a material that consists of many crystals. But crystals that are oriented in different, in different orientations so that things don't line up at the boundaries. The boundaries between the different orientations we call a grain boundary. And at a grain boundary, the atoms don't match up well. A grain boundary is the source of a lot of defects. And these defects affect the electronic performance of a material. They degrade the electronic performance in general. Okay, so the third type of crystal uh, of semiconductor then is we've talked about crystalline, we've talked about polycrystalline, there's also amorphous. And amorphous semiconductors don't have any long range uh, order. The atoms are not in a precise location specified by a crystal lattice and basis. Uh, although they don't have long range order, as I said earlier, they tend to have short range behavior. In a silicon lattice, each atom is surrounded by four nearest neighbors. In amorphous silicon, each atom is surrounded by, on average, about four silicon atoms. So the electronic properties of amorphous uh, silicon tend to be somewhat similar to the electronic properties of crystalline silicon. So we can summarize by saying that um, the three main categories of semiconductors are crystalline. Crystalline semiconductors are the most expensive because it's difficult to grow them without defects and to put every atom in its precise location where it needs to be. But they have the highest electronic quality because they have the fewest defects. Polycrystalline semiconductors are generally less expensive to produce, but these grain boundaries can impede current flow. They're used. They're used when the highest quality isn't needed, but where cost is very important. So, for example, in solar cells where you need large areas of, of uh, semiconductor crystals, polycrystalline materials are often used. And amorphous sil uh, semiconductors are the least expensive. Their electronic properties are the poorest, but they're adequate for many purposes. And when cost is critical, for example, in the thin film transistors in your flat panel displays, amorphous silicon might be used. Okay. So these are the three main categories of uh, semiconducting crystals. We will be concentrating in this course on crystalline materials because they're the easiest to understand. But the general concepts that we will, uh, that we will discuss apply broadly to polycrystalline and to amorphous semiconductors as well. So the concepts that we discuss and learn in this course can be used to think about how polycrystalline and amorphous semiconductors work as well. Okay, so just to summarize, semiconductors crystallize in specific structures. For example, the diamond lattice is the crystal structure of silicon and germanium. We Crystalline, polycrystalline, and amorphous semiconductors are all used depending on cost and performance considerations for the particular application of interest. We're going to focus on crystalline semiconductors, but the general concepts here will apply to the other class as well. Okay, so in the next lecture, we'll talk about a technical detail, and that detail is how do we specify directions and planes in a crystal? Because directions and planes in a crystal can have an important effect on the operation of a device. That will be the subject of lecture three.